Fred, thanks for joining us. Let's uh, first of all just talk a little bit about what we ha saw last week and what we may get this week. What we last week saw was clearly some market panic and very thin volumes, most people actually being on holiday, a bit of a delayed reaction to the S&P downgrade and perhaps more fundamental problems about Europe. I think we have to get used to this volatility, actually. It's uh, something we'll see for years to come. We're not going to see these return to stable markets that we had before the global financial crisis. Why is that the case? Well, we have, uh, first of all, we have people much more on the edge in terms of risk on, risk off. Uh, that's because we had such a traumatic period in 2008 and subsequently that people are immediately cutting their exposure. Uh, at the same time, we also have growth that's much more volatile in itself. Because of deleveraging pressures, these economies are much weaker. If you get a bit of a shock, such as higher oil prices, immediately growth slows down. People think the worst, even though it might not be a double-dip recession, but that introduces much more volatility. But, what, what, what think people are saying more and more is that, I mean, you say it's a bit dicey out there in one of your reports, and, you know, when you also see what's coming up ahead, are we going to just see anemic growth for, well, years? I think in the West, for sure, yeah. That's, that looks more like that uh, the Europe, and certainly, and, and perhaps also even the U.S., is going to grow a bit Japan-like for the next two or three years. So you think so with the, the way that also U.S. two-year notes, uh, what they're yielding right now? Exactly, and, and uh, we know that the Fed will keep low interest rates low, just as the Bank of Japan did. They even added quantitative easing again. We wouldn't rule that out in the U.S. as well. So it looks as if the West is in, not for a double-dip recession or a nasty recession, but rather very weak, disappointing growth. And that will actually even be more of an argument to invest in Asia and fuel further growth here. Yeah, well, you know, also do you invest because, uh, in Asia? Because the export story, of course, is one of the things which is a key driver. And when you've got two of your biggest export markets showing for a little growth, you know, you've got to question how much demand there's going to be. Well, we actually generating demand artificially with uh, higher credit growth, with very loose monetary policy, frothy asset markets, and that's uh, helping to offset the weakness in exports. There's a bit of a risk here down the road, but for the time being, Asia has sufficient firepower to sustain growth, even in the face of weaker Western growth. Okay, and if we did get another round of money printing, uh, does it all end up here, or do you think there'll be deliberate action taken the next time that, that they'd be keeping trying to keep the money within the U.S. to stimulate growth where it's needed. Well, I think actually the big risk is policy action by Asian central banks. If we see another round of QE3 with money pushing into Asia, um, I'm more worried about uh, Asian central banks throwing in regulations, capital controls, effects regulations, just to, to stem the, uh, the flood. Uh, and that's therefore policy risk is not just a, a risk in, in the West, but equally in Asia as well. Okay, just it keeps on going up and up and up. Is there, you know, any point at which just the, you know, the intervention would work and would work at any for a length of time? I think we've reached actually the point where the SMB, the Swiss National Bank, has reached a limit of outright currency intervention. That's why it's trying to pull the plug and throw uh, wheels in the sand of currency markets by introducing these uh, negative interest rates for deposits. For do, you think that's a, that, do you think that's a goer? Do you think it's going to be a flyer, that one? Do you think they'd actually be able to do it? I think it'd just be a short-term uh, relief for the markets and that the currency might stabilize a little bit. And even the target that they mentioned of 110 is actually, from the economic perspective, uh, not necessarily competitive level either. Uh, you probably have to uh, peg the currency at 130 to the euro if you really want to regain some of the competitiveness. So uh, but ironically, I mean, when you talk about uh, areas which are growing like Asia, who may perhaps still buy Swiss goods. Don't forget, Swiss goods are very high up on the value chain. When you look at that, the demand for them is more inelastic than others. That's right. So there's some leeway there, but the degree of appreciation of the Swiss franc has been such that you at the margin lose competitiveness. And in the luxury goods sector, there's certainly some uh, insensitivity to the pricing, yeah. but uh, Switzerland is also a big exporter of petrochemicals or chemicals in general, other machine tools, etc. And it's that part of the economy plus tourism that is starting to hurt. Uh, let's talk a little bit also because the, the yen faces the same sort of headwinds, doesn't it? Yeah, and here we've seen also BOJ come in much more aggressively again, intervening in the FX market and announcing further monetary easing. We wouldn't expect their FX controls to come in anytime soon, but certainly what the BOJ can do is intervene again unilaterally and also probably announce another round of quantitative easing. That would help a lot to lock in uh, the yen at a more competitive level. Yeah, and what is a competitive level? Because, you know, we still, we've seen another 
Well, they're in a recession again, aren't they, the Japanese? But, I mean, of course, uh, we had the dreadful events of March, which are partly responsible for continued contraction. And plus, the economy was for years dependent on exports. So if you now have weakening exports because of weakening demand in the West, plus a rising currency, plus the domestic dislocations, this is really a, a triple whammy for the Japanese economy. So the BOJ has to make sure that the yen doesn't appreciate further. And probably, you know, keeping the, the currency around 78, 80, that would be uh, uh, perfect. But clearly, we've seen much more upside pressure. But it doesn't that. work. I mean, they've come in twice, and the really, the yen has gone straight back after a few days to where it was before. Is, is there anything you could do there? What sort of policy prescriptions can you have for Japan? I think Japan, essentially, the BOJ has to trump the Fed and say, whatever the Fed does, we have to be even more aggressive in monetary easing. Only that would, at the margin, help a little bit in stabilizing the yen, plus intervention coming in in unexpected times just to knock out some of the speculators in the market. But granted, it's very difficult to control currencies. The larger the market, and the Japanese yen market is, is enormous, uh, the harder it is to control the currency. I had a guest on earlier from J.P. Morgan Asset Management saying that uh, it's policymakers around the world. He's saying we're long on politicians and short on leadership. Uh, that's what he was suggesting and saying that everything at the moment has been decided just to get more time and gain more time. Would you agree with him? I would, I would phrase it in, in terms of the return of policy risk. Uh, in the West, we don't exactly have major leadership. We saw the U.S. debt ceiling debacle. We saw in Europe wrangling over how to extend funding to the peripherals. Uh, in Asia, we're also going to get increase in policy risk, which is the reimposition of currency controls, of uh, lending restrictions, because there's just too much capital headed into Asia, and that problem is only going to get worse. So uh, we were talking about what? Uh, the economy? Yep. Uh, double dip? QE3? What's the status there? No double dip. No QE3 for the time. No, that's a big call. They'll call it something else. Would you call it some, some, something else? Uh, yeah. Or maybe call it let's not print money again. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, they could do, uh, what could they do? They could replace the longer maturing yeah, there's bonds, a, there's the short term. Yeah, there's a lot of things to do, I think, longer, before yeah. QE3 is being rolled out. Because remember, inflation is actually quite high in the U.S. And there's inflation is quite high in the U.S.? Inflation is running between 1.5% and 2%. Are you looking at core inflation? No, we're looking at general headline inflation. But the federal bank uses core inflation. Does that baffle you? Well, even core inflation is actually yeah. running at uh, you know fairly elevated levels. So yeah. it's not like last year where we had deflationary right. pressures, and it was easy for the Fed to come in and do QE2. Zeb, Zeb, let's come back from uh, New York. Tell me what the mood was like there. Well, the, the mood was uh, a, a little bit difficult in the past few weeks as they tried to negotiate this debt deal. And, of course, what we've seen with the markets hasn't really encouraged people. But take a step back. I mean, you seem to be taking a more of an optimistic tack here. You look at the latest retail sales figures. Uh, the jobs numbers have not been as terrible. And the most recent report is, was expected. And look at the news out of Japan today. Perhaps there is some reason for optimism out there. This rebound we're seeing in markets, at least, you know, maybe found it. Well, we have retail spending coming in, uh, I would say, someone say yeah. optimistically on Friday. Four month high or something. But consumer yeah. confidence was down. Yeah, I mean, I so think how do you... one, of the, one of the big question marks is how this last week uh, in the markets, the volatility really impacted broader psychology of businesses and of consumers. And we saw the University of Michigan consumer confidence numbers mm -hmm. on Friday, obviously tanking, which is a more recent measure than the retail sales. Mm -hmm. And if we get some stability into markets this week and next, I think then uh, we, we shouldn't see too big an impact on the economy, actually. And, uh, well, you know, how does it translate for Asian investors mm -hmm. here? How do they look at it? Well, they obviously are still worried about it, particularly Europe. I think people are less worried about the U.S. at this stage than about Europe. And there we have, still have to see some policy proposals to really uh, ease people's concern that there are broader systemic issues at hand here. Um, but locally in Asia, actually, the economic news is not too bad. Mm -hmm. Chinese retail sales, again, stronger. Uh, we see Japan today. We see exports actually not too bad in July. So uh, as far as local demand in Asia is going, that's, that's still humming. Now, you had a, a report out recently that said policy risk. Where's the policy risk globally right now? Well, in the West, it is that we don't have policy leadership. Uh, there's still, you know, that's probably what markets are worried about the most. There's no clear roadmap in Europe where we actually are taking things. Uh, in Asia, the policy risk comes from the fact that as Western central banks flush the system with liquidity, yeah. that's going to rush into Asia, and I think more and more there'll be pressure for capital control. Yeah, you can say that the regulatory environment is under challenge, and that could actually uh, be a solution for one particular 
crisis, but it could, uh, well, cause a long-term scar, couldn't it? That's a danger. I think the risk is that we're going back to a period of 1960s and 70s, broadly speaking, where governments impose more regulations, uh, not just in the West, but also in Asia. So the period of, of long-term liberalization is over. Uh, we see this in Switzerland, for example, these proposals to bring in restrictions on currency transactions. And uh, there was a very interesting paper written by Carmen Reinhardt. Uh, she's a, she's a Robots, famous uh, uh, yes. progress co-author. Co yes. Yeah, that's right. And, and she argues that uh, we, you know, one of the ways to get out of these debt mess in, in the West is to use financial repression, which we used in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, which hmm. is governments obtain funding for their own funding needs by forcing investors to invest uh, with them. And so there's an addition of regulation coming back in. That's ultimately the way to solve sovereign crisis. Well, that's kind of like, I guess, uh, what do you think about the banning of short selling in, in Europe? Because you're, you're, I guess, trying to control the market so you can see the end result you want on the markets, which is not these big declines, right? Hmm. Yes. It's been interesting to also watch China's reaction to the whole U.S. debt debacle, you know, these con persistent warnings from China to, to get your, your act together. And I, I wonder how much influence that yields in, in Washington and, the, you know, in the halls of Congress or whether they uh, slug it off. And I was thinking about this this morning watching uh, Mr. Locke there in Beijing. I wonder how he, how far he is going to try to smooth over some of these uh, relations or feelings about these debt issues. Interesting. I think actually in that regard, the S&P downgrade was probably actually helpful. A lot of people criticized that, but I think it was a wake-up call for U.S. politicians to actually start to tackle this. What about the SEC wanting to go in and investigate the math behind the S&P downgrade? I mean, this is really getting political, don't you think? It's getting a bit better. Jim <laughs> <ridiculous. laughs> Guider's in the mix as well going on about that as well, saying it was a monumental failure of arithmetic or something along those lines. Financial failure, almost, yeah. yes. <laughs> a bit of an indictment there against S&P. <laughs> now, you were on vacation last week during the panic. You were on the beaches in Vietnam. I hid on the beaches. Yeah, I recommend it to anybody who's working in markets. When you see red on your screen, just go out on the beach and call it a day. Get the tickets booked. Um, but you know, I, when you come, came back, did it feel any different to you at all? Well, the, the funny thing was that markets actually at the end of the week weren't really different from where when I left it. Okay. Just in between, you had these enormous, uh, this enormous volatility. Um, the only thing that we, we really see is that uh, commodity prices have come off, oil has come off, and that's actually a positive thing. But equity markets are somewhat down, but not as much as the headline would have suggested during the week. So sometimes it's good to step away, just uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, hide on the beach. Yes. Some, take some vacation time. Absolutely. So, Avoid a temporary panic. Right, so where do we go from here, basically, Fred? If we head towards you know, into the end of the year, basically, what, what's going to happen? Look, I think the U.S. is going to be uh, relatively quiet for the time being in terms of policy risk. Uh, we have a Fed announcement. We have a somewhat of a debt deal. You're talking about Jackson Hole, are you? Uh, he says no well, QE3, Jackson remember? Hole, obviously, yeah. we might get perhaps a bit more flesh out of Bernanke in terms of what else it can do, put on the table. But I think the eyes will be squarely on Europe at this point. We have the summit uh, between Merkel and Sarkozy. That's going to be key here, isn't it? Because we've got to get uh, some sort of idea and some notionality of uh, fiscal union, not just monetary union, right? Yeah, and I think ultimately everybody ha knows that we have to move to some sort of, uh, some form of fiscal integration ultimately, and it's politically very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. So they're taking baby steps, and we'll get a lot of volatility along the way, but that's the end point probably okay, where as, we have to As head. a Luxembourger and as a economist, how do you feel about it? <laughs> Where are you going um, with this? <laughs> well, Luxembourg did very well on the European integration, and so closer integration works very well. Um, I think there has to be a quid for quo. If we get fiscal union of some sort, there has to be also a, a very strict mechanism whereby the boring countries actually it's can sell, deliver. Uh, it's a Merkel, though, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the day, it's the Germans who end up having to foot the bill, in essence, isn't well, it? Well, you get a wow. you get a wait for Sarkozy to play the violin to Merkel and to get her to. But agree. you know, someone said, said Germany has actually benefited. From the weak euro, mm. so I mean, you know, you have to pay for the benefits, I guess. Of well, uh, like the Deutsche Mark, basically, now. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, so I think we've covered everything. Yep. Okay, Fred. Thanks for joining Thank us. You.